Now I'm just going to go through a ton of demos that let us use linked lists instead of the built-in list sequence in order to do all sorts of sequence manipulation. Here we go. So our linked list class is already defined. And we also have, s as an example, the square function and the odd function. The first linked list processing function we're going to write is called extend links, which takes in two linked lists and returns one linked list with all the elements of s followed by all the elements of t. Now we'll write this recursively. Recursively, there's a base case that says if s is link dot empty, then all the elements of s followed by all the elements of t is just t. In this case, we don't need to create any new lists. We have one that already satisfies the result that we're looking for. Otherwise, there's some element in s, which means we can return a new linked list which has the first element of s as its first element. Now we need the rest of the elements of s and the elements of t all in one linked list, and we get that by calling extend link on s.rest and t. If s is 3, 4, 5, then extend link s and s gives us 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5. We can also, for instance, extend 4, 5 with just 5, and we'll get 4, 5, 5. Next, we'll implement a function called map link. Map link returns a linked list where f has been applied to each element in s. If s is link.empty, then there are no elements to which to apply f. We can just return s. Otherwise, we do need to return a linked list which has a first element that I get by calling f on s.first. Now, we can't just have s.rest as the rest of this list, because we have to call f on each element in s.rest. Fortunately, we have a function that does just that. It's called map link. I map link f over all of s.rest, and I get the result that I want. So if I square all the elements in s, I get 9, 16, and 25. Next, we'll implement a function called filter link. Filter link also takes in a function f and a linked list s. What you get back is a linked list with a subset of all the elements in s, only those elements for which f returns true. Now this again is a recursive function. If s is link.empty, then there's no filtering to be done. We just return s. Otherwise, we're going to filter the rest of the list first, and then decide what to do with it. So let's introduce a local name called filtered, which is the result of calling filter link on f and s.rest. This might contain everything in s.rest or a subset of it, depending on what that filter function is. Next, I have to decide whether to keep the first element or not. If it's the case that calling f on s.first returns a true value, then what I'd like to return from filter link is a linked list that does contain s.first, followed by the filtered rest of the list. Otherwise, I'm not going to include s.first at all, because it didn't pass the test, the f test. It got an f. So then we just return filtered. The filter link function lets us take in a function such as odd and a sequence such as 3, 4, 5 and give us back only the odd parts. So here's 3, 5, which I could then call to pass to map and square all of those, and I get 9 and 25. What's going on here is the same operation as if I had written a list comprehension. So square x for x in 3, 4, 5, if odd x also gives me 9, 25. So we've come up with two higher order functions, because they take functions as arguments, which together allow us to express the same thing as a list comprehension. 
In fact, this idea of using map and filter in order to process sequences is very old. And the idea that they could be expressed as a list comprehension is something that's Python specific. Not Python specific in that only Python uses this. But many programming languages only have map and filter in order to express the same idea that in Python we typically use a list comprehension for. OK, what's next? Here's a function called join link. The join link function returns a string of the items in S that are separated by some separator. So how is this supposed to work? I pass in 3, 4, 5, my linked list, as well as a separator, such as a comma. And what it returns is 3, 4, 5, all in one string. So if it's the case that S is link.empty, that's a base case where I'll just return an empty string. Now there's a second base case, the base case that s.rest is link.empty. If that's the case, then I'm just going to return the string of s.first. No separators needed because I only have this one element. OK, so in my recursive case, I actually know that there's at least two elements in s. And what I'll return is the string version of s.first, followed by a separator, followed by the result of calling a join link on s.rest and the separator. Let's squeeze all this into one line here. OK. So you may have noticed already that s takes up a lot of space to print out. And when I extend s and s, I really have a mess on my hands. Wouldn't it be nice if I just wrote the values without all the link? We can do that using join link, which takes in 345, 345, as well as a string with a comma and a space, and returns 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5. Ah, much better. OK. Now we'll revisit one of our old friends. The partitions function. We're going to build a linked list full of linked lists, each of which represents a partition of the number n using parts up to size m. So this is some linked list that contains integers that sum up to n. No one of those integers is allowed to be greater than m. Let's remember the base cases. If it's the case that n equals 0, then it is possible to partition that, and there's exactly one way to do it, using an empty list. Now I'm returning one list containing the empty list, which is to say there is one way of partitioning it, but that partition has nothing in it. If n is less than 0, or it's the case that m equals 0, then there's really no way to partition this n using parts up to size m. We've reached a failure case. OK, now we can get the recursive case. One way is that we could use m. So what does it mean to use m? It means we call partitions on n minus m using m, and that means we've used one m in there. Now, in order to create, now, OK, so partitions returns a list of partitions. If we want to say that m appears on the front of each partition, we need to write down the result of map link, a function that takes in some partition p and returns m followed by p. And we map that onto using m. OK, we're getting close. It's also possible that you could not use m at all which is the result of calling partitions on n and m minus 1. Now the final return value is the combination of all the ways of using m and not using m. So that would be extend link with m and without m. Let's see if we can interpret this result. What are the partitions of the number 2 using parts up to size 1? 
Well, I could have one and one. What about using parts up to size two? Well, I could have two or one and one. What about using partitioning six, using parts up to size four? Well, now we have a huge mess. My goodness. What if we came up with a way to print that out? That's what print partitions is for. So print partitions prints the partitions of n using parts up to size m. It will do that by computing partitions and then joining those strings. OK, so first, let's get all the partitions as lists. Or we can call these links. Now the lines of the output you get by mapping the following function. A function that takes in a partition and joins it using a separator plus. Because that's what we do. We add together all the parts of the partition to get the whole. And we're mapping this function over the links. Finally, we want to print out each of these lines. So one way to do that is to map print over the lines. And there you have it. All the different ways of making 6 using parts up to size 4. Or all the ways of making 10 using parts up to size 10. And there are quite a few of those.